All right, everyone, we are back. So um, welcome to the second of five presentations um, in our national tour. And this presentation is on electrical fire losses. Before we jump into it, just want to go through a few points as I've done in the previous uh, session for those that are just joining now. Um, so we're gonna be doing a live Q&A at the end of the session. So please feel free to submit your questions via the text box under the webinar screen. And uh, we will be addressing your questions anonymously, um, time permitting. We'll be sending each of you a completion certificate and a follow-up email next week. And if you have any sort of technical issues, you can please uh, email us at webinar at origin-and-cause.com. So let's get started on, um, I would like to introduce to you our first speaker uh, being Martin Coles, who's out of our Edmonton office. He's an electrical forensic engineer and fire investigator. He has 15 years of industry experience and has conducted over 450 forensic investigations. He has been accepted as an expert witness in court, and his technical specialties include fire investigation, electrical and electronic failures, product liability, and alarm system analysis. Our second presenter is Saeed Ismail. He is out of our Ancaster office, and um, he's an electrical forensic engineer and fire investigator with over 15 years of industry experience and has conducted over 100 forensic investigations. He's overseen hundreds of electrical incident investigations, uh, including equipment failures, uh, worker injury and fatalities, uh, improper installations. His technical specialties include fire investigation, electrical and electronic failures, product liability, and electrical codes and standards. So I'll pass off the mic to Martin to get us going. Martin? Um, I'm, I'm not hearing anything. Is that just on my side or Mark, can you hear anything? No, I can't hear Martin as well. Okay, so Martin, we see your screen. Okay, so I'll shift back to my screen. Sorry guys. Martin, do you mind doing a quick sound check? Input hey. and output are both showing my headset hands-free. I can, I can, I can hear you. I can see my mic moving now. We can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear us? Am I uh, audible now? Yes, sir. Excellent, excellent. Sorry about that, everybody. No problem at all. All right. Well, um, as I was as I was trying to say, but uh, apparently it wasn't coming through. Um, thanks everybody for uh, for for attending this. Um, I'm happy to share this subject with you all. Um, I'll be talking about uh, electrical related fire losses, in particular um, surrounding small failures leading to potentially quite large losses. Um, so electrical faults do create some interesting complications for us investigators because 
generally the physical scale of the failure is actually quite small. Um, this uh, small size can then be sort of masked by ensuing damage. Um, I'm sure this is actually a lot like fires caused by cigarette butts in that that little small item can get way out of hand. I'm sure every adjuster out there has heard the question, I mean, could really a tiny thing like that cigarette butt wipe out a whole house? And of course, once you get a flaming fire, the answer is obviously yes. Um, but electrical failures are different from cigarettes in that there are often more traces left behind. Um, you do find metallic components. You do find tripped breakers away from the fire. And sometimes you do find other electrical damage elsewhere in the building. Um, so, uh, so yeah, electrical faults do tend to occupy a very small space. These faults can create a lot of heat in a very concentrated area, um, which is of course enough heat to ignite a fire. And then um, the other thing about small electrical failures is that those fires can, once they, they, they transition to a flaming mode, um, they can spread through a concealed space unobserved for a good length of time. Um, so this picture that we're looking at here, um, it shows an electrical fire fault um, in its incipient stages. As you can see, there's these uh, plastic components over here that are um, that are starting to char. And um, if this if this failure, you can see the the amount of concentrated heat right next to that screw. If this failure is allowed to progress, it can produce a uh, um, it can produce a fire, which potentially can lead to the total loss of a building. So the, the case study I'm going to talk about involves a uh, involves a hot tub. Um, the notice we got from the homeowner's adjuster was that there was a fire involving a hot tub that then spread to the house. Um, the hot tub was relatively new, um, but it had replaced one that had experienced a smaller fire the year before. Unfortunately, that previous fire um, was not investigated in detail. Um, so no causation information was shared with me on the previous incident. Um, the fire department reported that the subject fire um, appeared to have originated from inside that hot tub. Um, but unfortunately, there were no early witnesses because the homeowners were not home. So here are the remains of that hot tub. Um, the damage to the house here does indeed look relatively minor, um, but as you can see, the fire did spread to this deck, and then um, this allowed the fire to extend into the house through a patio door um, just around this corner here. So here is a closer view of the hot tub with its inner workings, um, things like pumps, um, heaters, controls, all in the foreground. Um, at first glance, these did not; these components didn't didn't seem particularly remarkable. They were pretty evenly damaged, um, with similar levels of oxidation, similar depth of charring to combustibles at each end of the uh, of the deck, the um, the sort of utility deck where all these these items were mounted. Um, as you can see, though. Uh, the light was very challenging on the day of uh, of my um, scene examination. We had one of those days that you frequently get in wintertime in the prairies. Um, there was a very bright sun, um, but it was at a fairly low angle. And so this creates very sharp shadows. Um, the other thing, it also constricts the pupils. So it's difficult to make out the details in those shadows. And uh, this consequently makes photography fairly challenging in these uh, in these situations. We'll get into that a little bit later on too. Um, so here we're looking at the control board where the power actually lands for the hot tub. Um, notice that we have these copper conductors here um, carrying power to the uh, to the hot tub. So we haven't identified a. Uh, uh, any signs of failure on the power system here. Um, the, uh, the, the board, so it's this printed circuit board that you can see just behind these screw lugs. Um, the board certainly looks like it was exposed to fire, but there's no real concentration of damage anywhere on that board. 
Um, these connections appear to be sound, and there's no sign of electrical arcing on the, uh, the power conductors yet. So what I did is I dug around, I traced the, uh, um, I dug around a little bit and I found, this is the supply line that was bringing power to the hot tub. Um, as you can see in this location, there is um, intact insulation and jacketing on the cable. Um, this indicates that the origin of the fire had to have been closer to the connection we just looked at in the previous slide, or potentially that this particular area was somehow protected from the fire, or of course both. So I traced that supply line back towards the house where the power would have originated, and it went down under the, the hot tub assembly through a plywood layer. Um, and that's uh, where I've indicated there is where it goes down sort of towards the ground. Um, so near where that point was, there was, uh, um, as you can see here, there was some melting of that line. The, the insulation had failed there and the aluminum itself melted. Um, the big find here though, more so than that uh, melting aluminum, is that this is aluminum and it doesn't match the copper we saw earlier, which told me a couple of things here. Number one, we have a new potential point of origin where the conductors are melted. Um, though melting aluminum doesn't take a lot of heat in exposure to fire terms. Um, it also tells us that there must have been a connection between these aluminum and copper conductors somewhere. Just as a side note though, um, aluminum conductors are likely appropriate here. Um, these were installed when the, uh, when the, the first hot tub was, uh, was installed. Um, and that was several years prior, but even, even with timing, yeah, it still, it still appears appropriate. This is a non-homeowner serviceable line. Um, the idea is that it's only ever touched by professionals and aluminum connections when they're done properly don't necessarily lead to fires. Um, you do still pretty regularly see larger gauge conductors like those for stoves um, installed with aluminum conductors because they're not expected to be accessed by non-professionals. And this is of course because aluminum is a lot cheaper than copper and this cost difference increases rapidly with gauge size. Um, so as you may know, copper is a better conductor of electricity than aluminum, but that difference is overcome when you factor in the difference in price. It's actually cheaper to use a, uh, a larger gauge aluminum than smaller gauge copper in almost all cases. As long as those aluminum connections are made properly and by trained professionals, they can be just as robust and safe as copper. So I excavated the, uh, the other way along that aluminum back towards the, uh, the, the power board um, to try to find the connection to the copper. And after a, sh a short time, I found um, those connections. So as we see here, we've got the aluminum cable coming out of the debris here. We have those copper cables, those copper lines running to the power board here. And in these locations, we've got connections. Um, these connections were made by made with wire nuts, um, which are commonly called morettes. Here's what they look like um, before they've been affected by fire. So that's that's what we're talking about. Um, and but at first, when I'm looking at this image, I only see three connections rather than um, rather than the four, which I should see. This is a 240 volt supply, so I should see two hots, a neutral, and a ground connection. Um, but at first I only see three. Um, so poking around a little bit below those connections, I came across these two items. So that, that little bead is a blob of metal, which is at least partially copper. And this cone is the, um, the remains of the wire nut um, with metal embedded inside that cone. Um, so these pieces indicate that certainly the connection came apart either at the outset of the fire or during fire progression. Um, and we, it also establishes for the first time a really unique point of damage in the hot tub assembly. Um, so it's the only place where electrical damage has certainly occurred. Um, because that melted aluminum wiring that we saw earlier doesn't necessarily represent electrical damage. It could just be 
melting because of exposure to fire. So I collected from the scene that entire deck of electrical and heat producing equipment, um, as well as the bead and the marette for later lab examination. Um, so here we're looking at it from basically the same direction we saw it before, um, from sort of the outside of the hot tub. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the light on the day of the scene exam was very challenging, um, but the lab lighting made some, fa some, some fairly subtle patterns of damage um, visible in a way that just wasn't possible on scene. Um, these kinds of patterns did in include um, like some increase in oxidation intensity to metal parts towards those connections that we all already identified, um, which you can see those copper conductors um, sort of over here, just past this uh, pump motor. Um, so we saw some increase in oxidation. We did also see some subtle increase in um, damage to combustible materials in that direction too. Um, so the lab exam included, included myself as well as an investigator representing the installer of this new hot tub. Um, this would have been the contractor who made those copper and aluminum wire nut connections. Um, given that those patterns were um, the, uh, the, the, the damage patterns were actually visible in the more even lab light, um, we were able to isolate the fire origin to the area around those connections pretty easily. So here's a, here's a much closer view of the, of the remains of the wire nut as well as that bead. Um, as the wire nut was making um, the connection between aluminum and copper, I had to consider a couple of things um, that would be required to make that connection code compliant. Um, number one is that the wire nut itself must be approved for aluminum and copper connections. Um, of course, at this point, we have no branding information. We don't have the package that they came from, so we can't, we can't really evaluate that. Um, Number two was is that there must be an antioxidant paste smeared into the connection so that the aluminum does not oxidize and introduce a connection. Um, so this paste, it's a very thick, um, viscous material. Um, it's almost like it's almost like a uh, I don't know a smooth peanut butter that you have to that you have to wipe into these very greasy, um, uh, very very viscous material that you uh, that you smear into there. Um, now that paste could be potentially identified th uh, through the presence of zinc. Zinc is its sort of active ingredient um, from metallurgical analysis involving a scanning electron microscope. Another thing that the, uh, the other investigator uh, reported was that um, his installer reported that they usually use copper conductors only. So when they're installing a, a hot tub from scratch, they run a copper line back to the uh, back to the breaker panel rather than aluminum but they did know that the board um, connection the connections on the board that we looked at earlier um, were not aluminum compatible and so they didn't want to use those directly um, so what they did was they put in a copper pigtail um, which is really just a jumper uh, a line from the aluminum connection to the board so a short couple of feet of copper line um, so it was that connection between um, between the copper pigtail and the aluminum line where uh, where we had our failure, and that's where this uh, this wire nut was installed. Um, so here's a comparison shot of the wire nut we looked at in the last slide alongside one of the others. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there was some subtle but clear damage um, bringing us towards these connections. Um, so we've got a probable origin around these connections already. Um, and those gradients also allowed us to rule out that isolated section of melted aluminum wiring we saw earlier, um, if we hadn't already by other circumstances. But uh, this, um, this means that we had to have had a small section that was more exposed to heat than, uh, than at some point in fire development than the rest. Um, as I said, aluminum wiring with its relatively low melting point will be expected to melt away when exposed directly to fire, which must have just happened in that other area. Um, so here, 
we see much more extensive signs of oxidation on the metallic components of the subject wire nut, this one here, relative to this one, um, which remained intact. Um, so basically that is rusting of the, uh, of the metallic components. Um, and that generally does occur more with more exposure to heat um, and can be, a, can be a fairly strong sign of localizing a failure. So um, since we've established an origin near these connections and we have one connection with significantly greater damage than the others, um, we, we have really isolated our failure to this one connection inside the space of a, about sort of less than like a couple of cubic centimeters, I would say. Um, so it is possible that this poor connection may have been caused by an absence of that antioxidant paste at the connection, which of course is a failure created during the installation. Um, and that paste could also, um, so as I said, that paste could be identified if we did SEM, the scanning electron microscope, um, elemental analysis. Um, and that would have involved destructive examination of the wire nut. Basically, we have to cut it, and I'll go back. We would have to section it across like this and do elemental an analysis of that revealed, the revealed surface inside. Um, but uh, of course, that's destructive analysis, which is why I wasn't able to do it independently um, before the other party was involved. Um, that said, it is also possible that even with the paste present, the connection may have just been loose, which also would have pointed towards a failure during installation. Um, of course, being sort of a fire nerd, an engineer, um, I, was, uh, I was really excited to maybe get to do that testing. But um, realistically, it would have only been a single data point indicating failure that already had very strong evidence. And our two potential failures were both related to the installation of that copper jumper. Um, and so despite my academic interest in doing that metallurgical analysis, the economics of the situation really won out. Um, and at the end of the day, the installer's insurer accepted liability without, without having to go through that process. Um, so really that's how the, this, uh, this case concluded. Um, and uh, yeah, it ends my case study. Um, and I'll pass things over to Saeed now um, to carry on with a case study of his own. Good day, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me clearly and hopefully you can't hear as well the construction that's uh, outside my office here. Uh, we welcome. A lot of clear seed and no construction. <laughs> Beauty. I think these guys are just far enough working on the laneway behind me. In any case, welcome everybody. And um, thank you again uh, for coming to the national tour. And um, what I would be discussing right now, and uh, again, Thanks for the introduction, George and uh, Martin, for passing this on. Um, in my situation, I'm talking about the sump pump, which is something that uh, I'm sure many of us have seen failures of. And um, as Martin alluded to, you know, when you have an electrical failure like this, in many cases, it could be something small, but uh, in the specific case study I'm going to show you, uh, this one turned out to be a fairly large loss in the six figures and um, all due to a sump pump failure. Now, preliminarily, the sump pump can fail in many different ways and the loss can be of different formats. Obviously, you can have uh, a flood water uh, type loss or you can have a, um, a fire loss. In this case, I will touch on a few of the points, but I will concentrate on how the electrical failure in this case resulted in a large loss fire. So we're all familiar with sump pumps. I'm sure many of us have seen the different losses. Now, what are some possible causes for these? 
you may have an improper design. So for example, if you have the wrong pump size and it can't keep up with, with uh, flooding water, it can overwork the pump and it can fail. You might have uh, an improper design in the sense of a, a float switch that can't handle uh, the proper load. You might have a missing check valve, which uh, its purpose is to make sure the discharge uh, pipe does not allow contaminated water and uh, foreign objects in. You may have a component failure, such as a stuck or a float switch, uh, a stuck float switch, for example. Um, it could be due to aging and or end of life, and that could be sped up by overworking the sump pump. Um, it could be also due to lack of maintenance. Uh, presumably, a lot of uh, the manufacturers will say you should check your sump pump every three to four months um, and make sure there are no objects obstructing, that the switches are working, everything seems to be fine. And also, there could be an internal failure to one of the other electrical components, such as a capacitor, centrifugal switch, a high limit, uh, high temperature limits, safety switch, and uh, I'll touch on those, uh, especially the capacitor, during our case, as uh, this becomes a critical point of how this one failed. Also, um, you might have an unapproved product. Now, this could start at the manufacturer. Um, sometimes when the international products come in, they have a certification label on it, and uh, it could be a counterfeit label, or the manufacturer could have unapproved components within the product if there's been modifications after the product was given the proper certification. So for example, on uh, all devices or appliances, you will find some kind of an approval label on it. It could be, for example, um, not limited to uh, CSA, UL, Intertech, and there are many others now. And uh, in these situations, um, a lot of counterfeiters have figured out how to make a counterfeit label look very precise and it can look real until something happens and you dig into the guts of, of the device you're looking at and you find out that there's all kinds of wrong inside it. Now, Health Canada takes care of the consumer products and I can speak for Ontario, the Electrical Safety Authority looks at the end products coming this way. And in this case, they both got involved. Uh, a modified product, if a component fails within your product, you might be tempted to change something within this product. If you open up that device, technically, in a lot of cases, as soon as you make any kind of modifications, in some cases, as soon as you open it, that certification that's on it, that approval is null and void. Now it's no longer an approved product. Uh, in another situation, you could have an improper installation or wiring. This could be a contractor that had miswired this product, and in some cases, you'll find the branch circuit is the source of the fire. And the final, finally, one of the other possible causes would be an impeded impeller or some kind of obstruction that uh, does not allow the uh, motor to function properly, and it can overheat, resulting in a fire. Now, for this particular case, we had a detached home, and this was part of um, a subdivision that was all built fairly new at the time. And what's the advantage of that is that, you know, when a builder builds homes in a subdivision, sometimes, you know, they could get a good discount on getting the, a bunch of the same items from the same supplier. And uh, we we're fortunate enough in this case for that to work in our favor as we were looking forensically at this situation. Now the equipment has evolved in technology when it comes to sump pumps. And in this situation, you know, there are certain sump pumps, I'll go back to the capacitors that we were discussing earlier. So there's something in a sump pump called a starting or a start capacitor. And there's another type of capacitor called an inline capacitor. Now I'm not gonna go into the, deep into the sciences of how capacitors work and everything, but the most important thing you need to know in this case is that a capacitor has several tasks. One is to regulate the voltage. Two is for the incoming current when 
that's this is the starting capacitor. You might have a spike in current, and the capacitor is supposed to absorb that so that the motor windings don't end up taking the brunt of it. And three capacitors are you look have to look at them as they store energy. So anything that stores energy naturally can heat up. And if the capacitor is you know not properly sized, if it's not the proper type of capacitor, if it's not a capacitor that can handle certain heat, you can overheat. And just like anything else, if there are ignitable combustibles around it, they may ignite in the process. So in this case, the sump pump was in the basement and it was on a dedicated circuit as it should be. And the receptacle was GFCI protected although this is not a requirement of the code, of the Canadian Electrical Code, um, it is a requirement now for it to be AFCI protected, which is an arc fault circuit interruption. Uh, GFCI, in case I haven't mentioned yet, is a ground fault circuit interruption. So a GFCI, just very quickly, is supposed to protect us from a fault uh, when there's a ground fault from getting a shock. And AFCI is to protect the wiring when there is a certain level of arcing that can result in a fire. Now, in this particular case, the fire was um, did spread through the wall. It started at the sump pump in that corner of the basement. There was nothing else on the receptacle. There was nothing else within the vicinity and the fire patterns indicated that it started at this pedestal style sump pump. And the fire uh, spread through the wall cavity vertically above the area of the sump pump in the basement and into the ceiling. And due to all the fire damage and smoke soot deposits across the house, the damage caused by the migration of smoke and all other failures or all other um, damage was well over $100,000. Now, no other sources of ignition were in the area of origin in this case. During the examination of the sump pump, one could see that the cord cap for the power cord was still attached to the receptacle. You can see that in the left picture here. And through examination of that receptacle, there was no evident electrical failure. So the receptacle was ruled out as the source of ignition. When you look at the right photo, you could see how it was connected still to the top of, or the motor housing of the sump pump. The area where there the float switch used to be located in its own plastic housing was melted off and was severely damaged. And I will show you a close up of that in a minute. However, the fire patterns did corroborate that it started around that motor housing. Now you can see the close up of the float switch remains on top of the motor housing. And the right photo, these are the contact arms from the float switch with some apparent failure. And this was determined to be resulting from the fire, not the cause of the fire in this case. Now, back to my point about the looking for exemplars. In this case, because it was a new subdivision and there were more uh, exemplars than you can imagine the whole subdivision was using the same type of uh, sump pump. You could see we were able to obtain at least a couple of them, and this one was in good condition. And in this case, in the left picture, you can see how the that float switch that I was just talking about, um, when it's intact, this is how it looks like. And the motor housing, you can still see everything's intact. And then when on the right hand side highlighted when the float switch cover is removed you can see when the housing is lifted that the contact arms how they look like when they're intact
Now, how do you identify if you got the right exemplar? I mean, if you, you can't just assume this. So when you take it into the lab and you do a destructive examination, there are a few ways that a person may be able to identify this. In this case, once a, once a destructive examination was conducted, you could see several, several items or several characteristics of these sump pumps, like that waffle pattern on the bottom, it's identical. And then a second method also is, although the label on the sump pump, on the incident sump pump was illegible at this point, you can also um, identify just based on the remains of the label, the location of it, it is very similar to the location of the uh, exemplar sump pump. So with a few of these characteristics identified, and of course, the shape of the um, motor housing and several other characteristics, you can almost with certainty um, say that this is a similar uh, sump pump. In this case, once the cap of the motor housing is removed, comparing the exemplar to the actual um, incident sump pump, you could see in this case that the motor windings were fairly intact, relatively speaking. So a lot of the damage that you see is above the motor windings. In fact, when we looked a bit closer, there was still some varnish remaining towards the bottom of the motor of the motor windings and which tells me that something that was sitting on top of the windings or in that general area may have failed now what is on top of the windings i'm about to show you what it looks like when it's in good condition but what you can find at the top there is the capacitor that we mentioned earlier in this case there wasn't two capacitors, there was only one capacitor. This is not uncommon to have the starting capacitor as well as the inline capacitor as one capacitor doing both duties. This, in this case, the capacitor would have sat somewhere in this area and you would have also the thermal protection at that location. Now here's what it looks like when it's in good condition. On the left, you'll see a close-up of the inside, the interior of the motor housing. This is the exemplar with the lid removed, and you can see um, the components in good shape. Now I will go back a little bit between the two of them so I can tell you what we're looking at. This is that magical capacitor that we're talking about. And once it was removed, it was sitting here, the float switch is along the side here and the thermal protector which not as easy to see on top of the windings here but once it was removed you can find it down there now this becomes significant when we're telling the story of how this fire occurred now what is the purpose of the thermal protection the thermal protector if there is generated heat in the general area of the thermal protector it can it is in line it'll open it'll stop the pump from working for a short period of time to allow it to cool down it's not intended to continually function um, consecutively one time and time again basically if there's a, a general failure that's not being rectified this is supposed to only allow it to cool down um, occasionally. Why that becomes significant? In this situation, the thermal protector was embedded in the debris and the remains of the capacitor that was originally mounted above it, they were removed for examination and they were in this general area here. Now on the right you'll see the thermal protector was removed and opened and once the pads were examined, they did exhibit evidence of repeated interruptions. So physically pitting was observed. And I will show you a, micro, uh, um, a shot under the microscope that shows all the pitting, but there was evidence of 
arcing, there was uh, evidence of electrical activity, and more so than typically these um, thermal protectors are meant to take. It's easy to identify it once you look down here and you can see some of the, the beads and the pits. And this is electrical activity. And this is not just a thermal, uh, thermal protector uh, cutting off once or twice. This is continuous activity, nonstop. This, this thermal protector sensed something major happening and kept trying to interrupt. And you remember earlier when I was talking about certain components can fail earlier than expected. Now, if you overwork a thermal protector like this to this degree, it's not impossible for it to stop working and to fail. And if you lose your thermal protector, now you're in trouble because now there's some, nothing to stop the pump from working if it's overheating. Now, one of the secondary exemplars that we obtained also gave us a real good insight. We were very fortunate in the sense that opening the top of the motor housing in this particular case, you can actually see the remains or half remains of a capacitor. This, this one didn't create a fire in the home, but once you open that motor housing, you could see that there is some damage here and there are signs of overheating. And this capacitor was well on its way to failing. And that in and of itself gives you an indication, well, you know, from the start to the end, this was halfway through or some way along the way where this could have happened. So this allowed us to kind of build a more comprehensive picture of what may have happened in this situation. So looking at this, and through the destructive examination, we were able to identify and to say, okay, the capacitor in this type of installation is always connected to its circuit. And it would appear that the capacitor was on the verge of failing, which would cause the motor to overheat if this capacitor is overheated. Now, this can result in the thermal protector to repeatedly activate because you got some major overheating it's not slowing down until one of them failed. Either the capacitor failed and caused um, ignition of surrounding combustibles, or the thermal protector may have failed, followed by this capacitor remaining overheating until it reaches an ignition point of the surrounding, um, its own housing and surrounding combustibles. So once that thermal protector was compromised, the capacitor is, 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 gonna, is, not, is not gonna stop and it's gonna continue to uh, overheat until something happens. And in this case, it was uh, ready to be igniting everything surrounding it. Now, due to this being identified as more than just one sump pump having this issue, the investigator did submit this concern to Health Canada on a national level and to the Electrical Safety Authority in Ontario as a product safety concern. Results of that investigation were still pending. However, the manufacturer um, of this sump pump did settle and there has been no further known cases of capacitor failures for this type of sump pump since. Now, what? why is the question? And that, although that can't be decisively answered through the testing that we've done, a theory would be that this capacitor uh, could not handle the load or, or it could have just been a bad batch of capacitors for those sump pumps in the subdivision. Now, what would qualify or has the potential to qualify for grounds for subrogation. An improper design, for example, if the manufacturer improperly designed the product or if one of the components failed and it turns out that these components were not proper for this product, the manufacturer may be subrogated against. If the product is unapproved 
from the manufacturer and it was the manufacturer that created this product and not properly approved it it's not properly tested or certified definitely that you can subrogate against the manufacturer if it's an unapproved product because somebody modified it um, it depends on who modified the product if it was a contractor that modified it and decided it can still install this and use it you can certainly subrogate against a contractor for that if it's an improper installation in terms of wiring or the like you can also if the depending on the contractor that may have done it or if it's a homeowner it could be a negligent um, install and if it's an impeded impeller or if there's some type of obstruction also um, this could be uh, grounds as negligence although in this case it's those ones are a little harder to subrogate against from from uh, my experience this is what we have for this one Great. thank you for uh, hearing me out thank you Saeed and thank you Martin so we are going to start the Q&A period now so folks, if you have any questions, please submit them in the questions tab uh, lower there in the uh, in the GoToWebinar console. So we'll jump into it. Um, one question that we have, can you hear me okay, uh, Saeed and Martin? You're good. Yeah. No problem, George. Okay, great. So uh, first question, I have had several hot tub claims recently. Is this increasingly more common? And what are the most common causes you see with hot tub claims? So I, I guess that's for Martin. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say that I've noticed a particular trend, I don't think. Um, but that doesn't that certainly doesn't mean there isn't one. It could just be that I'm not getting those assignments. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I would say the most common things to look out for are it's kind of the same stuff as as anywhere else. The fact is it is a it is a fairly large um, large load. It's a large electrical load, and so if you do get a poor connection, like we like we saw in the uh, in the case study, if you do get a poor connection, you produce a lot of heat there. Um, and so that can occur pretty fast. Um, and that is related, I think, to a, uh, uh, I don't want to say necessarily a lack of regulation, but you want for, for um, hot tub hookups, you're not always getting, um, you're sometimes getting staff from the hot tub place that are not necessarily um, potentially journeyman electricians or uh, journeyman plumbers. And so um, it's sort of a, a combination kind of thing. And it's it can fall through the cracks of, re of regulation in uh, out there. So that may be related um, to seeing to seeing more. Um, the other thing that we see, it's the kind of thing that homeowners attempt. And clearly there are hazards present. So perhaps uh, perhaps that's what we're seeing, somebody trying to save a bit of money. Yes. And just out of curiosity, um, is there a large percentage of electrical fires that you see that the homeowners or someone that was not a licensed electrician um, may have contributed to the cause of the incident? Is that something very common you uh, come across? I wouldn't say it's massively common. You may see it in particularly, like I say, particularly in larger larger conductors where there's more, more energy available, uh, a, a larger on a larger break or something like that. Um, but people replace it, doing stuff like replacing outlets not particularly. What we see much more of is misuse of the stuff outside the wall. Um, so overuse of extension cords, um, use of extension cords for large devices like space heaters, 
and then potentially them being covered up and insulated. Those are the kinds of things that we see user error much more than problems inside the wall. Okay. Okay. And uh, George, I'll I'll, I'll yes. jump on that a little bit too. Uh, from our end of uh, of the uh, geographical location, I'm talking about Ontario. Um, in Ontario, the Ontario Electrical Safety Code does allow a homeowner to do some of their wiring. Of course, they have to get it properly inspected, and uh, in which case, we do see a mixed bag in here for things, as Martin suggested, outside the walls, but also inside the walls. I've just had uh, one last year where uh, the homeowner did their own wiring. They somewhat admitted it, and uh, as a result, um, they were they, they didn't ground their receptacles. And in fact, in one situation, one receptacle they reversed the uh, hot and neutral. Ah, okay. And would you say that that represents like a substantial percentage of claims that you? encounter issues with installation like uh, electrical installation or or is it a negligible or not a substantial percentage say well I, I think i think it's it's something um that's caught early on uh fortunately you know it's it's caught at the inspection level i when i was with the electrical safety authority there was a lot more near misses that we've caught than there are fires so yeah. thankful for that um yeah. but there are ways that you know the insurance companies can try to mitigate that to ensure when they're when they're insuring um martin touched earlier on if you have aluminum wires aluminum wires are not in in and of themselves hazardous as martin suggested he said they're they're actually pretty safe if you use them properly unfortunately there are a lot of homes that have a mix of copper and aluminum and i know that there are some insurance companies that require an electrical inspection otherwise other ones may not even touch aluminum which i can understand and i can appreciate um, there are certain devices and certain wiring methods that you can do that can handle both aluminum and copper and there are receptacles that have aluminum and copper stamping on them that allow you to use both wires to terminate but you can't just buy just a run of the mill um receptacle for copper and think that it's going to work the same way with aluminum so but okay. yeah so there are many cases unfortunately or fortunately rather there aren't as many fires to uh to speak to those okay next question why did they use copper and aluminum in installing the hot tub was that just in this particular case or is that typical um i would say it's not typical exactly um in this particular case the um the original installation used so if you recall there was a previous fire that unfortunately i don't know much about but the and in, that initial installation used aluminum conductors from the there was a sub panel in the garage and there were aluminum conductors from that sub panel out to the hot tub now it's possible that the original the original hot tub did have aluminum copper approved connections and that that aluminum just landed right on the power board from the original hot tub but in this instance the installer that was doing the um doing the replacement found that the uh they they were aware that the that the board connection on this new hot tub was not aluminum approved. And so they put that jumper in there. Um, this is actually a very common practice. You do actually, it, those sort of condo buildings, for example, that were built when aluminum branch circuit wiring was, um, was prevalent, um, are some of them now are going through a process of putting copper pigtails, hiring an electrical contractor, to put copper pigtails at every switch and outlet in the building um, so that anything that is user accessible, you know, like if, if, if you want to put a smart light switch or something, the, the individual unit owner isn't interfacing with aluminum conductors. They're dealing with copper. So it's not, it's not super unusual to see a 
pigtail at the very end where there's just a short length of copper and aluminum carrying the load back to the, the breaker panel. Um, so that was kind of a one-off in this instance, but it's like in terms of a hot tub, but it's not, un it's not completely uncommon. You do see it. Cool. Okay, well, that's very good to know. Um, next question. Is there anything you can do with equipment or software to get um, better photos in scenarios where the lighting is is um, affecting the quality of your images? Are there any ethical concerns about enhancing digital photos? Um, yeah, I think I think, I think that's really asking probably asking about the poor light from my hot tub yeah. examination. Um, so. Yeah, there's actually um, NFPA 921, the the guide for fire and explosion investigations that we uh, that we use. It does talk about this a little bit, and um, basically, it is as long as you're retaining your um, your and your original JPEG that comes right out of your camera, or your raw image, or or however you're doing it. Um, as long as you retain that, you can tinker with things like brightness and contrast and stuff like that, and those do help to a point. Um, they, there is a limit. Um, what you do not want to start doing, certainly I don't want to start um, sort of adjusting brightness and contrast locally within a photo. If I'm doing it, I want to do it to the whole photo just so that it's easy to take a slider and move it back um, so that the whole, so that I'm not doing really um, sophisticated stuff that might then raise questions later on. Um, but yeah, my goal is to, if, if I need to adjust brightness or contrast, I try to minimize it. I do my best to get the pictures the best I can in camera on scene. Um, but there are times when it's difficult and, um, and some adjustments need to be made, but try to keep them limited, try to keep them affecting the whole photo. Um, so that it's it's easy to show and absolutely critical to retain that original the original image right out of the camera okay great thank you um next question i guess this could be open to either of you what is a good resource to find recalled products I can I can jump on this one and then uh, I, yeah Martin if you have some more I uh, look at usually the Canada uh, Canadian government website I have a couple of links I can send over for across Canada uh, in Ontario the Electrical Safety Authority has a product recall uh, link as well and in the in the U.S. Uh, the conserver uh, consumer services protection I think. Um, it's I have the website for that as well. So I usually check all three in my in my situation when I have to see if a product is uh, if there are any recalls. How about you, Martin? Yeah, that's exactly what I do as well. I just make sure that I'm checking both Canada and the U.S. Okay, great. Um, are there any specific electrical installation requirements for? things like hot tubs that have open water. Those specifics, um, actually I, I wouldn't I wouldn't mind hearing Saeed's, Saeed's uh, impression on this as well, but um, those specifics are often covered by manufacturer requirements. Um, the of course, the water is supposed to be kept separate from the uh, from the electrical equipment. Um, but yeah, there are. I mean, it's not really blanket rules. It's more product to product, is my is my understanding. Do you have uh, anything else to say about that, Saeed? Well, the the, the code requirement the code doesn't talk about um, what are the requirements of a product in and of itself if it has contains water. So the electrical code will say, and this is whether it's Canadian electrical code or Ontario version, that um, the product shall be used for what it's intended and in a safe manner. So then to Martin's point, you have to follow the manufacturer instructions 
to the T because they're going to do everything they can to make it safe. Now, that said, any electrical wiring that's nearby those kind of products, like a hot tub, for example, or like a sink, there is certain requirements if it's within a certain distance that you have to have ground fault circuit interruption. So that's for the receptacles that are nearby. That's the most major um, requirement. I'm not going to get into if it's a hazardous area or conditions. I mean, different fluids, like if you're at a gas station, that has a whole other section in the code. But in terms of water in and of itself, that's basically what you need to know. Manufacturer instructions for the product itself, and then the code requirements for nearby that they have to be ground fault protected. Great, thank you. Next question, what are the proper steps to take when securing evidence, um, i.e. chain of custody, when moving things to labs? Um, this again, it sounds like it might be, uh, might be thinking about my, uh, my hot tub. Um, basically the, one of the, one of the key things is if by doing that, you're going to be, um, you're going to be modifying it in a significant way, then it is best to like, if it's possible, it is best to keep that at the scene so that everybody interested can see it in the context of the scene if possible sometimes work has to progress if you don't move it then like or you don't start dealing with a specific space then the loss becomes much much larger obviously there there are some some concerns there um and in those cases the key thing is documentation making sure you get photos of of the item in place beforehand making sure that you deal with your paperwork in terms of chain of custody um, so that it's recorded, that it's being removed from location A to storage warehouse B um, and that it's being done, like who it's being done by. Um, and then ideally you have sort of logs of who's coming and going from your storage location and all that sort of stuff. So making sure that your paperwork, making sure that your notes, making sure that your photos, are all consistent with one another is uh, is a big thing and provide all the information to an investigator that might become involved later um, if they need it. Great, thank you, Martin. Next question, the sump pump case. What is your protocol or procedure for obtaining exemplars from other homes? I mean, in this situation, I guess, you have to uh, just document everything. If you go to a neighbor at so-and-so unit, you document that this is the neighbor you went to, you had this conversation with them, you ask them um, if you can take a look at their sump pump. You know, if you mention that there may be issues with their sump pump, I think they'd probably be more than happy to see, for you to see that if, if that issue exists with theirs. Um, and uh, generally speaking, when the manufacturer gets wind of something like this, they're pretty, um, I won't say as a general rule, but they can be, they can be uh, amicable to helping out and, you know, replacing these things. So, you know, a home won't end up without a sump pump. But from your end, the things that you can control is that you, again, as Martin suggested earlier, you document everything properly. And if you have to secure it, you secure a sump pump properly, you bag it, you tag it, you bring it back and you're, um, you know, examining things and with the, with the proper documentation. So don't think it's anything too different than what you would normally do per NFPA 921, but in this case, uh, it's the sum pump. Yes. Is it common to find the exact pump model in a neighborhood? Like I imagine that, that it would be in the event that it's... Um, say like a subdivision where there's you know a bunch of homes with sumps and the men and the uh the builder probably would install the same pump or, or approximately the same pump is that is that accurate guys i uh, sorry martin you're gonna say something no i wasn't go ahead 
Well, I, I actually wanted to hear from you as well and in, in, in oh, your sure. neck of the woods. Like in terms of tracking down similar items? Um, yeah, the, the, the question yeah. is, is it common to find the same kind of pump or exact model in a neighborhood? And I've if, heard of this quite quite yeah. often in subdivisions. Even sometimes like uh, builders can can incentivize uh, homeowners like to actually buy the home um, by putting even the same appliances. So they'll say, hey, we'll throw in the kitchen appliances. And so if an appliance caused a, a fire of some sort, um, it, you could very well knock on a neighbor's door and they would have the exact same appliances in such circumstances. For sure. Yeah. And I mean, I would consider that getting lucky, but sure, it does happen. Like in a, especially in a newer neighborhood um, where the builders and contractors were all the same. Yeah. Um, if you're looking at an older neighborhood, you know, like a 1960s kind of neighborhood, um, you're going to be out of luck. That's yeah. almost certainly not going to work. Yeah. Um, but there's, and then um, if a if a homeowner or an insured can can find a receipt. Or uh, or maybe uh, or something like that. If you're lucky again, your your item might still be on the market, um, depending what it is. There's certain certain devices have a sort of a slow market turnover that it's a, the same model stays out there for for a good long time. But other kinds of devices, and we're seeing this more and more, um, particularly with sort of small battery powered devices in particular. Those those things change so fast. They're made in one run, um, in you know one factory, and then and they're available for six months, and then the next one, you know, the the following year, you you can't find one to save your life. So it's a mixed bag for sure. Yeah, and uh, to add to that too, I mean, um, with the sump pumps. Um, once they're past the 10 or 15 year mark, it's, it's tough if you're looking at subrogation purposes anyway. So it works well with the fact that it's the newer builds that have sometimes similar items like some pumps or like HRVs. You know, you have a subdivision, you're going to probably likely find the same kind of HRV. And our HRV was a big thing about 15 years ago uh, when they first came out. Uh, there, was, there was a few failures. And it wasn't hard to track them down and to understand because they were the same ones being used over and over again in the same neighborhoods. Because they were typically supplied by the builder, correct? That's correct. Well, yeah. So they're they are supplied supplied usually with the, with that with the house. So in newer complexes, it's it's a significantly higher probability than, as Martin stated, at older kind of areas. That's it's really I, I it's a little hack that's that's worth um, considering. It's like you know I've even heard of toilets toilets failing, and um, I know our materials team has knocked on a few doors in a in a subdivision because obviously toilets are supplied by a builder and they typically will buy them in in bulk, and um, have used this little technique to find other exemplars that have not yet failed. Um, so it's it's a it's a really cool little tip if if um, if you do need uh, an exemplar to to be knocking on a couple of neighbor neighbors doors. And Thank you guys. That, that's really great. Sorry, go ahead. No, no. I just wanted to kind of wrap that up. Just basically saying, basically for that purpose, it's not the only reason why you knock on the neighbors' doors. It's one of the techniques that you use. For example, surveillance footage, because like Martin mentioned earlier, with electrical fires, they're they're pretty sneaky. And uh, sometimes it's a very, very small thing that happened first. And uh, sometimes what you need is a good video of something watching where the fire originated or from where it's coming from. And that can, that can go a long way in figuring out an electrical fire or in other fires for that. Yeah, and I imagine it to be so much easier to obtain such footage with all like, you know, the, the ring doorbells and stuff that are kind of pointing out in a typical residential area. In addition to, of course, like typical um, surveillance in commercial um, areas. Exactly. Yes. It is getting easier, but you would be surprised how many of those are dummies that people just have as a deterrent that's not running. Like the number oh. of do doors you knock on 
they're like, oh yeah, that's just a fake. Don't worry about it. Uh, and it's like, oh. <laughs> it happens all the time. Yeah. Okay, cool. Next question I have here. What is typical life expectancy of a sump pump? I know you had touched on this side. Um, is there a reasonable length of time or age um, at which point it is reasonable for it to fail? Uh, there's no, there's nothing etched in stone. There's nobody that's ever said this is a this is a rule. After this date, it expires. It's not like milk. So, but um, where where you have to be careful is I think typically uh, the, the the sweet spot is somewhere between 10 to 15 years. And uh, even just a simple searches online, you'll see uh, some manufacturers say after 10 years you may have to replace a certain part or a certain whatever so um they're very careful about that but uh i would say you know if you hit 15 years after that it would probably be pretty tough to subrogate against the manufacturer for a failure of, of their product great thank you next question do you notify the electrical safety authority whenever you notify the tssa two different things so i'll take this one on because it's ontario um, TSSA will do fuels and lifting devices. ESA is, a, is, a, is the Electricity Act and therefore wiring installations and three other electrical related regulations. There is some overlap, but it depends on what's happening. If you have, if you have an HVAC failure and you're not sure if it's a fuel related issue that caused it or if it's uh, electrical, you may want to inform both. Um, if it's if it's a, a, a gas uh, dryer, I'm guessing that TSSA will be on your list. If it's an electric dryer, then ESA may want to know. So it's it's a little bit different, but I mean, if you have doubts, it doesn't hurt to call and see if they're interested in what just happened, right? Because they might want to follow up with their own investigation as well. Great. Last question here. Was the first hot tub fire related to the second fire or the cause? I think you touched on this, Martin. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have information on that. Um, the uh, as I said, the this was not this wasn't in a big city. The um, it wasn't a highly sophisticated fire department doing um, routine detailed investigations on everything, and at that time the the loss as i understand it the first loss was fairly small the insurance company did not do a detailed investigation at that time um they just sort of replaced the hot tub and moved on and um is my understanding so i didn't get any investigative information out of that initial one unfortunately so it's possible that there was a similar mechanism but i don't unfortunately know and do you typically request that information from the adjuster? Like, I imagine, like, so how did you find out that there was another loss? Was that in conversation with the adjuster? Exactly. Yeah. She, she did say that this was a, um, that they had had a similar, a similar, well, not a similar, but a hot tub fire. And that this, that she was actually mentioning that I think more in terms of this is a relatively recent installation uh, so um okay. we and, and then typically we would like to and initially we'd like to rule out the installation because it's relatively recent so there's going to be questions raised and of course we weren't able to rule out the installation that's where we landed um and so uh so yeah that's that's really all that i i learned about it unfortunately it was just yep that's what happened there was a previous fire um, and I did speak to the homeowner about it too. And she was like, I was never satisfied with learning what actually happened. Um, I'm now scared of hot tubs because this has happened twice. So, uh, so yeah, that's, um, unfortunately that's, uh, that's how it, that's how it went down. Okay. Well, it's just a, a nice, you know, um, thing to remember that, you know, as an insurer, if you have access to that information of, you know, say a related incident, um, a related claim, uh, Martin, would you say that that is 
um, appropriate information to share in the, on the onset of a forensic um, investigation? Would that be would that be perceived as uh, biasing your investigation, or would that be uh, good to have technical information? Um, I think it depends on the nature of the information. Um, I would prefer not to get information about, um, we had a previous fire. I like if I don't want to hear, we had a previous fire. I think this guy said it himself, but we could never prove it. I, that's, that's going to be, that can be problematic. Um, yes. but and something like in the sense that it could be, it could be perceived as, um, contributing to your to bias causation right or like yeah, yeah exactly exactly um and i have seen situations where a um early on an adjuster even just something that seemingly as innocent as you know looks like we've got a juicy one here that actually gets brought up in court in trial like five years later and it's embarrassing for everybody and it's presented to say hey, this is introducing bias. Um, but it's, uh, but in the, in the instance where it's a similar loss, where there was a, where it can, like certainly history of a building can provide relevant technical information. And if the building has a history of, um, particularly say electrical failures, that's one of the first questions that we ask homeowners it's like what's the history of the house have you had problems with the electrical system have you had problems with the heating system um and so it's absolutely appropriate to say this building has a history including a fire involving the electrical system or involving the hot tub that's that's relevant um but and it's technical funny. information yeah and and i guess the slight difference in in how that information is presented is that it's being led by the forensic experts inquiry rather than it being sent said you know volunteered um and information kind of sent to the end the expert um without being done in a kind of methodical way to control bias yeah. right? and i would be comfortable with an adjuster in the in the i don't like we don't want them to comment on causation in the in the assignment but i would be comfortable with an adjuster in like a background information section saying um this is this is not first claim for this house the previous claim was determined to be caused by x that as long as it's presented in a factual way as long yeah. as we're provided just facts and not impressions um then then we can use that factual information legitimately yeah okay great thank you martin appreciate it we've gone a couple of minutes over uh, i do apologize for that but i i do thank you martin and saeed for um for this really great session i have martin and saeed's contact information on the screen now um, and we will just, we'll be taking a 12 minute break and then we'll be hopping into our next topic. Right. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.